good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Sally Clark. I work for, at the University of Washington, and I want to welcome you to the inaugural show of this season's Louder Than Words here at Othello UW Commons. For folks who see this video later on, we're in the Othello neighborhood in Southeast Seattle. This is a space for collaborative learning and teaching that the University of Washington and the community occupy at different times. Um, students, staff, faculty, um, and community folks make use of the space. And we are very happy to be back here with Louder Than Words. Louder Than Words is a series that we started last year. And you'll see in your programs that Louder Than Words was started as a way for um, a few of us to think about how could the Othello Commons get involved in trying to bring forward the people who are working to get around and at and through and beyond the division and the strife that is, has pretty much been everywhere around us. I guess pre-pandemic, but the pandemic really kind of brought it to everybody in really strong ways. And we thought, you know what, this space can do something here. We can bring people together for uh, great dialogues, for meaningful conversations, and hopefully give people um, inspiration and ideas for how you move forward and think about the conflict and the disparities and the division that you encounter in your own worlds. The format here uh, tonight, um, uh, I'll say in a moment, but we are going to do the land acknowledgement that the University of Washington starts um, events with, and so I'll need my glasses for that. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. So I'm going to introduce Ed Taylor, who is the Vice Provost and Dean of Undergraduate Academic Affairs here at the University of Washington, where he oversees the educational opportunities that advance and deepen the undergraduate academic experience. Ed is a professor in the College of Education, and his research interests include the moral dimensions of education, leadership in education, and social justice. His PhD is from the University of Washington. And with that, I'm going to get out of the way and leave this to you. <laughs> It's been wonderful to be a partner with you and work in this work. Thank you for acknowledging the land. And I also just want to take a second to acknowledge we've got some students and we've got community members, we've got parents in the room, school people in the room. And one of the things that we're holding heavy right now is there is a, a shooting at a local school that has, has weighed heavy on the minds of many people in our community. And part of the reason why we convene these conversations is to get our heads and hearts in action around what is it we do around the kind of suffering that's happening in our community. So I just want to acknowledge that and know that that's weighing heavy for many of us. Alicia, let me turn to you. <laughs> um, you've been in this community seven months, and I want to do a little bit of an introduction. People have a little bit of a bio for you. But I want to build your introduction into our, into our talk also. So thank you for, for having the courage to come and sit and talk about these issues when you haven't been in this community very long. So Alicia Washington is president and CEO of Seattle Foundation, one of the largest community foundations in the country. She leads the foundation's efforts to ignite transformational philanthropy, to invest deeply in efforts to advance racial equity, shared prosperity, and belonging. There's some powerful language in this, like shared prosperity, and I'm gonna talk about some of that language. Um, in your bio, though, because we've got some, some UW students in, in the room who are aspiring to be like you someday. In your bio, you went to Oberlin, college. You're, you're, an, you're an Overland student. So for people who may not know what Overland stands for, mm -hmm. talk a little bit about what Overland stands for and, and who you were at that time and how whatever happened at, at Overland inspired to be, you to be who you are now. Yeah, yeah. Well, a couple <clears throat> things. I mean, Overland, I think, is kind of world renowned for a couple things. One, the conservatory, you know, music. That's the thing that draws a lot of folks in. There's some even amazing musicians, including from Seattle, that went to Oakland that are doing amazing things today. Um, and then it's also had a, a very strong um, history and legacy around its role in um, abolitionism and the ways that it's like really what's the first to accept uh, black students and women and just a lot of that it did to kind of push progressively on issues that at that time and when the school was really coming about um, was not the norm that we were seeing across the country just because of the state of affairs, particularly around race and racism. Um, so Oberlin has made its mark that way and it's kind of been seen as this liberal, progressive space where kids from across the country globally, but particularly from the coast go. Um, but what was not the norm was for kids from Cleveland to go to Oberlin. Um, it was not really a city that the school was coming to, to recruit. 
I did not know Oberlin College existed, even though I lived 45 minutes away from Lorain County where the school is located. Um, it really was a, um, a guidance counselor that I had for a program that I was in called Upper Bound, which was one of the trio, federal trio programs back in the day that told me I needed to go to Oberlin. And I uh, dismissed that from her because my guidance counselor in high school went to Capital University in Columbus and told me that he could get me on a free ride. So I heard free ride, that means we're going to Capital University. Um, but this is back in the day when you actually had to put your name in a database for a school to mail things to you versus everything being so much online now. So she put my name in the database and I started getting all this material at my house about Oberlin. So I decided to finally give in and apply a day before the application was due. So I cut classes to sit in the computer room to work on that um, and get everything ready and mailed off. And I, unbeknownst to me at the time, I got early accepted and then was brought out for kind of a weekend visit and absolutely fell in love with the campus, with the people, um, and knew in that moment from that weekend, it was like, oh yeah, of course, this is where I have to go. This is where I have to be. And so I went to Oberlin and learned a lot about life and the world in a way that I didn't expect. You know, I grew up in the city of Cleveland in a neighborhood called Glenville on the east side, which had um, kind of transitioned from a predominantly Jewish community into a black community. Um, I grew up around black people. I didn't see many white folks, quite honestly, coming up just because the nature of Cleveland's history is a black city. So going to Oberlin, where I'm meeting people from across the world, um, was a daunting experience at first. Um, but over time, it helped me understand how the world was much bigger than my neighborhood. And even more so, it helped me step into my own brilliance because I had some amazing professors that saw something in me right away and really helped me tap into that to where I left Oberlin feeling very empowered that I absolutely could change the world and that there was a lot that I could do around issues that are in the civic sector around nonprofits and government and business to have real impact. Um, and it came from being in an environment where we were challenged with our own issues on campus across different student groups and how we were creative about ways that we engaged and give back to the community and even across the country, all the experiences that we had, it just created an opportunity to dream in a way that you know, 18, coming from Cleveland, going there, I was always an audacious believer in things that I could accomplish, but that ignited something in me that has carried me to this point. We are University of Washington people, so we're done with the Oberlin part of that, yeah. that conversation. Yeah. We're yeah. Gonna... Okay, <laughs> Boy, just hearing you talk about your experiences in, in Cleveland, you said predominantly black community. Mm -hmm. right? um, and so you know I'm gonna ask, so you made this transition from Cleveland, mm -hmm. um, which let, let's think a little bit about Cleveland. 47% um, black, 13% Hispanic, Latino, lots of black and, and brown people. Um, average income is 46,000 or so, average household income. Seattle, 65% white, 7%, um, a little more than 7% black. Household income around 97,000 or so. These are different cities. Yeah. And you got in your car and you left Cleveland, where you had done, where you had been formed and shaped and done a whole lot of community work, and made your way to Seattle and spent seven months in, in Seattle. Um, what high-level observations do you do you have? I'm not asking you to critique our city, but yeah. when you when you look at Seattle and when you make your way through, what are some grand challenges and grand opportunities you see in this Seattle relative to what you came from? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and you're right, you know, I don't feel like I'm in a position to critique the city because I'm still very much in the, in the mode of learning and observing a lot, but I had some really rich and deep observations so far since I've been here, right? And so I think, you know, I was in the space of community and economic development while I was in Cleveland. I, I was doing that for a good chunk of years. And what was fascinating to me is that as I was preparing to leave Cleveland, it was at a point in time where the city was really wrestling with the conversation of gentrification. Did that apply here in a real way? We're not there yet. We're still trying to recover markets since the 08 recession, and there's still so much work to do around addressing disinvestment and um, abandoned housing that we can't possibly be having a conversation around gentrification. So that was really a debate when it was clear that there were pockets of the city that were experiencing that. Um, but because it was not a wide scale thing, it was tough to really get into that mode of understanding what's the work we should be doing now to ensure that folks that have been in place for a while don't lose that opportunity as the market starts to change. Um, it was very different for me than stepping into an environment where gentrification has been 
rapid and moving, you know, for a longer period of time. And one of my first notable moments in just trying to read up on the city before I formally moved was just reading a lot about the Central District in particular, right? And just understanding a community that went from, you know, majority black folks to now all of a sudden that has turned to be single digit percentages. And then to get on the ground and walk the neighborhood and walk the community and see all these markers that remind me of um, black culture, but knowing that the presence is different, right? And then seeing that more broadly across the city, I think getting my head around the scale of what that looks like and, and on the coast, right, in a place like Seattle compared to Cleveland was a big observation I was taking in and kind of what that does for communities, what that does for um, how folks organize and come together around issues if their communities become dispersed in a way and fragmented in a way that you don't have that organic kind of gathering that happens when folks are really concentrated in place. Um, so that's a, that's a big one that stuck out right away to me because it had been such an ingrained part of my work before coming. I think the other observation, and this is my background, you know, being a lobbyist, being in the political realm, is thinking about the impact of, um, if you've been on a stretch of one-term mayors, what that does to a city's ability to move policy long-term on issues of importance, right? And so I come from a city where, um, shout out to former mayor Frank Jackson, he was in office for, I think, close to like 20 years. I mean, he was in office for a while and finally just made the decision that he wasn't gonna run again. So there's an amazing new young mayor there now, Justin Bibb, a good friend of mine, but it was a while before Cleveland got to the point and before he got to the point to step down. So it's fascinating for me to see and read about what's been happening here over the last, what, probably decade or so of like the turnover, um, because that doesn't just impact the person in the seat, it's also then like your cabinet directors, right? Like if there's a churn of people all the time, you're always starting over. And so, you know, the strength of the mayoral seat and policy that moves and then how other sectors connect into work that's happening on the ground here, that's a fascination that I'm holding and still unpacking to this very moment. That's an interesting observation that I've heard you make before, because yeah. those of us in the city have become almost used to turnovers, yeah. turnover among its leadership, including its mayor. And you come from a place where that long established yeah. mayors and leadership that have been there for a while. Yeah. Um, and you see this problematic somewhat in this, in this city, not necessarily a good. You I mean, when I listen to folks um, <clears throat> talk to me about it, right? Like I can understand from leaders in the nonprofit sector, or even the for-profit sector, the challenge that they feel with that. Because depending on the issue, if you know, if there's a issue around um, uh, revitalizing the waterfront, or if there's an issue around neighborhood development, if the players are always changing on these long-term policy issues, right? It's like you take three steps forward and then five steps back, right? And so there's just a curiosity that I hold around when we talk about collective impact and partnership across sectors, um, how does that play out in a, in a city when we're typically the mayoral seat is such a strong connecting point for that? If it's changing, what happens as a result of it? When you were at the George Gund Foundation in Cleveland, mm -hmm. part of your work was to revitalize community. I quote, revitalize community. Um, now, I, I just want to put on my citizen hat for a moment. If I live in, the, live in a community and I, and I hear uh, foundations and foundation leaders, especially those that hold wealth, mm -hmm. if, if they talk about revitalizing a community, I'm not always convinced that that, you know, that language sounds really, really good. Yeah. But if I haven't seen evidence of what that means, especially from people who are outside of the community, how do you bring depth to that language? So it's not just ethereal, but it means something to people. What, what does revitalizing a community mean to people who, who wake up each day and send their kids to school and shop at local stores and have to worry from paycheck to check. What does that mean to people in, in community? Yeah, so the starting point really for us at Gun at the time when I was there to define that area of work was really focusing on vibrant neighborhoods, right? And as I was starting to shape that work, it really came from conversations with folks like you, like residents, others to say, um, what do you think makes a thriving community? And there are things that I think we all hold to be true that keep coming up, right? Um, 
Are there good schools in my neighborhood? Do I know my neighbors? Can we strike up a conversation on the front porch or after work? Do I have access to foods that I want to eat, fresh and quality foods, right? Like how close is the grocery store? Um, are jobs nearby, right? How easy is it for me to get to transit, right? And so it became these mix of things of what's the infrastructure, what is the amenity? Do I have a home that I love that I can afford to be in? Right? And like, do I have a good relationship with the people that also live proximate to me? These became the things that really define what it meant to be in a vibrant place. And so I think the work became about how do we invest in ways that inspires that to happen and fosters that to happen. And for me, it's less about the foundation trying to stake claim in that, but it's to be investing in the right organizations and conversations and leveraging policy in such a way because really the decisions the government makes around community development and where resources flow and where they don't flow, right? Like that's a real tension in neighborhood development work. So how do we support that in a real way? And for me, a key point was always uh, resident voice and leadership has to be at the center of this because if, if folks live there, they should have say in what their communities look like and how they feel and what they have access to. So if that is a guiding focus to then investment and policy, I think we're on a good track to actually getting to vibrant places and places that feel revitalized. There's a little bit of a dilemma that you and I have begun talking about, which is you are the CEO of an organization where people who have money, who have wealth, have traditionally placed it with your foundation, an investment, investment banking model, a philanthropic banking model. Yeah hold the money and, and, and allocate it as the donor sees fit. So if I want my money to go to causes that are outside of this community, that's my choice, that's, that's my decision. How do you influence donors to give money to the communities that you're talking about, the communities that have suffered the most? Because at this foundation right now, a good percentage of the money isn't necessarily going to the communities that you're building relationships with. And so there's this gap, mm -hmm. convincing people. You're having a conversation with communities, building partnerships, but you've got communities with wealth that aren't necessarily involved in those communities. How do you deal with that, with that gap? How do yeah. you convince people to engage in community in the way that you are committed to? Yeah, and I think this is a, the, the higher level of this is that this is the turning point that community foundations find themselves in right now as a sector, right? So let's unpack the myth of a community foundation. I think what has long been the case is um, we tout asset size as a notion of strength, right? We carry a billion dollars or $3 billion or whatever it may be. But the reality is the model was created as a philanthropic bank, as you referenced. And so that meant that before a Charles Schwab or a Fidelity model came about to support donor advised funds, it was community foundation. So we hold these resources, we administer the grants per the donor's wish, um, and that was the focus and the role. But in the last, you know, I'll, I'll give it a decade to be generous, right? But like in this period of time, foundations have started, community foundations have started to evolve to really think about, is there an actual point of view we should be having because of where we sit, particularly as place-based institutions, right? And so, if you start to make that shift to say that it's not just about moving money the way that the donor is asking us to, right? And more about how do we think about the other roles that we have to play here around civic leadership and thought partnership and advocacy and service of what's happening in the community, it does create this tension that starts to exist, right? And, and depending on how the community foundation is structured, your ability and strength to move quickly on that may be limited because again, at the end of the day, while the numbers say Seattle Foundation holds a billion dollars in assets, it is a $12 million nonprofit that, yes, manages that much wealth, right? But wealth that is not within our control. The bulk of the other work that we try to do, like we have to fundraise for. It is a traditional nonprofit in that sense, right? And so that's the real of what's happening there. And other community foundations, depending on how long they've been around or how they set themselves up, may have an operating endowment. Again, this is traditional nonprofit structure, right, to have resources that you can pull on flexibly. Seattle Foundation doesn't have that. And so what I have to work through is that if I don't have the pot of money that allows me to move at will, regardless of where my donors sit, I have to now engage my donors as partners, right? I have to begin to make sure they understand the vision and the approach we have around serving community in a new way, and then understanding who's willing to come along with us on that journey to align their funding, to give in complementary ways. And I think the, 
The real scuttle is going to be in the coming years for the sector is, and for fund holders that are not interested in that, can we all say okay and then go our separate ways, right? That, that, is, that takes courage, that takes risk to also understand how do you s sustain an entity if you make those kind of choices. But I think this is the inflection point that we're getting to around having a clear position and who can be a community of support with you in that journey and being okay if folks don't want to be on that journey, that's fine. You mentioned the word civic leadership. And, and soon in these conversations, we're gonna have Chief Diaz, our, our Chief of Police. We're gonna have Brent Jones, our, our school superintendent. And entities that traditionally our communities have had to have a lot of faith in, we're dependent on these, on these public entities. But these are divided spaces now in our, in our nation. They've been divided in our city, in, in, in King County, and nationally as well. Talk about what civic leadership looks like for you as you enter into the fray. And you're entering into leadership right now at a really, really powerful time in our, in our city, and in our county, and in our, in our nation. So when you, use, when you talk about civic leadership, what does that mean to Alicia Washington? Yeah, for me, it really is. Um, no one sector can do any big, amazing things on their own. They just can't, right? Government is dependent on the private sector. Nonprofits play a particular role, which, you know, philanthropy is a part of that. Like, all these things are kind of codependent in a way, right? And so I think we, we achieve our best when we actually understand how to work together and play to the strengths of each of those sectors because you need to. And for me, when I think about civic leadership and work I've done in the past and how I'm approaching my time even getting acclimated into Seattle is, is what, are the, what are the key issues in front of us that it will require all of us to come together to move the needle on it, right? Like um, homelessness and housing is a big thing here. I knew that coming in to my first time that I flew into the city that as I came from the airport to my hotel, I saw encampments along the way, right? And it's at a scale that is daunting, which means no one sector can do it alone. Social service agencies can't do that on their own here. Government can't do it on its own, right? And so what are the things that are bringing us to the table to collectively work towards um, solutions on really complex issues? I want to read a, a quote, it's a statement that you made when you were first hired. When I think about my time in the community, I spend a lot of time thinking about the way in which systems can make a place feel undervalued and displaced. But when you go deep into the community, there are ways that people in community building across people make it something really beautiful and vibrant, particularly because of the black American experience I came from. There is, there is the ability to make something really beautiful out of nothing, or almost something really beautiful out of chaos or trauma. So you talked about making something beautiful out of chaos or trauma. Right? This was core, core to your belief. Can you give an example, like a real practical example of where you've seen beauty come from trauma or beauty come from chaos? Because I know that this is something that you deeply believe. Because I've heard you talk about, about joy, about black joy, about beauty. You, it's in your language. So talk about what that looks like in community, maybe some concrete examples of what that looks like for you. Yeah, well, the most global example, when you look at its origin story, is hip hop, it's hip hop culture, right? When you think about New York at that time in the late 60s and 70s and everything that was happening, you know, you know, one of my mentors loves the book, The Power Broker, how it talks about Robert Moses, but embedded in that story is the birth of hip hop culture, right? You see the decimation of, um, communities and neighborhoods and like how highways came through and you see these pictures of just abandoned and like rubble of buildings. But in the midst of all that, young people were throwing black parties that then led to the birth of rap and um, break dancing and graffiti art and DJing. And like, it could be seen as just kind of this throwaway thing, but within that was the creation of joy and art that has grown into this global phenomenon. But at its core, it was a way for young people to have an outlet and express the, about the life that was happening around them, right? And so that has always held true for me in terms of the origin story of a culture that has inspired and informed so much globally. It was born out of something very, very chaotic and, and trauma-filled, right? The, um, there's an organization here that I absolutely stand for. I've not met the leaders yet. I cannot wait. But Wanawari is something that sticks out to me when I look at the efforts that have started to happen in this community around reclaiming space, right, and reclaiming community. And I was um, 
when it was warmer outside, I went by Wanawari to uh, just peruse and bought a couple books. And one the one that I'm looking at and spending a lot of time with right now is that joy has a sound, right? And like what it means to be able to gather in community and throw block parties and just experience each other and laugh, right? And eat good food and be connected. And no one is policing that or harassing that, right? And like, and being willing to claim that space that like may not feel like it was once ours anymore because of how things change, but to say, no, we still have stake here because of the history and legacy, right? And so I think what happens and what I really want us to be mindful of is that it becomes really easy to tell the story of deficit, right? What a community lacks, how it doesn't have investment or things happening there, what it looks like in a way in terms of if it's not pretty or modern, but go deep into a place and you're gonna see things happening in terms of how people gather and how they spend time that I think is a part of like that joy or those beautiful things that are going on, but you gotta know how to move through a place to see that. So Wanawari is an interesting example. It's a lovely example because it has a place that it, it's a place that its foundation is about black home ownership, but when you walk in the door, and many people do walk in the door because it's an open door, you see art, mm -hmm. you see community engagement, you're welcomed in as if you're, as if you're home, mm -hmm. and it's a powerful example. Okay, so I, I want to come back to you personally because I was, I was on your search committee, um, and I, re I read your Vita, and I read your statement and all of that, but there's some things you left off your, your Vita, <laughs> and I'm curious why you left, left them off. In 2017, you were um, a celebrity dancer in, in <laughs> Cleveland. And in wow. 2021, you, were, you won a Mover and Shaker Awards. So you've got dancing and moving and shaking. What, what, what was going on? Why did you leave that off your, your Vita? Yeah, celebrity a, celebrity yeah, dancer, yeah, all these serious yeah, issues, yeah. right? <laughs> so, so. Well, the, so uh, again, I have, a, I have a deep love um, of hip hop, particularly 90s era, that is a part of what has shaped who I am. So. I did actually um, break dance in college. It was like a thing. I was in a whole kind of B-girl crew and went to California and did a whole bunch of stuff like that. Um, so the celebrity dance off thing was not anything I was looking to overly publicize. Uh, but it was a way to help raise charity for a really wonderful nonprofit in Cleveland called Groundwork. So um, in a way to also uh, freshen up again on being able to move. And then Mover and Shaker Awards, I mean, it's great to be recognized, but you know, I just, you know, I think you know at this point, I'm just about trying to do the work. If somebody recognizes that and wants to honor it, thank you, I'm appreciative, but I just want to do the work. You're being modest about that, Alicia, <laughs> but, but the narrative that I was seeing and all that, and I just about those, those particular things, but you were recognized in your community as someone who is, is an established leader, but also an emerging leader. So it was ripe with um, awards for 30 year olds or for mm -hmm. uh, under 40 and yeah. just this emerging and, it's, and this community is very very proud of you and and must have wanted to hold on to you tightly and I'm glad that they've let us have you for for the long term <laughs> for the long term I want to get back to a, 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 a issues of, of in which there's some tensions here um, um, so many organizations now have racial equity goals um, that have come about in the last five to six to seven years triggered by public events. Um, and many of those in this community are white-led organizations. Mm -hmm. Do you see a tension there with white-led organizations mm -hmm. trying to do community-engaged work, community philanthropic work, that don't necessarily have deep roots, but they're calling out social justice? What are the tensions that we see here? Mm -hmm. And what does civic leadership look like from your perspective, being a woman of color? Yeah, yeah, well, this was, um, this was a big, issue for me, especially at my time in Cleveland when I was working in philanthropy um, and as a black woman showing up in this way, right, to where there is a, there is a, a phenomenon of um, longstanding organizations, in most cases white-led, um, that now we are in this moment of recognizing that we need to be centering racial equity and justice and work everyone can pull together the quick statement or a couple of value statements that say, this is what we believe in. The hard part is putting all of this into practice in a real way, as we know, right? And there was always something to watch for in groups that could speak the language and had the level of relationships and political capital to raise the resources for work that they wanted to do in the name of racial equity and justice, however they were de defining that. Um, but we're missing kind of the details about how you show up and how you engage with community and how you talk to people in a way that doesn't cause harm, but actually is building a relationship. And it was an interesting tension to be in in that space because one, 
philanthropy had to check itself in terms of its own way that it shows up and causes harm and thought about that, but then also be in a position to address its stuff to then be able to work with grantees to address theirs, right? And so, I mean, there was a lot of movement and work that I found myself in to push on organizations to make sure they were actually going through real racial equity training or really being thoughtful about what is the diversity of your board? What is the diversity of your staff? What does your community engagement efforts really look like? Who's at the table, right? But like, I'm not interested in your perspective on the community engagement outcome. Either invite me to the thing or like, let me talk to the folks that you actually wanted to engage, right? And so when you started to break down to those kind of practicalities, that's when you started to sort out who was really trying but maybe needed help. And so then we knew as a foundation how to invest. Who was actually not interested but knew was the thing that if they were gonna get a grant, they had to use the language to try to move forward, right? Um, but who were all stars in the work? I, I knew an incredible organization, and shout them out as well, CHN Housing Partners, a housing organization in Cleveland led by um, a capable, um, white gentleman who really ingrained his own kind of racial equity framework that lived throughout the organization from how they measured themselves of success, how they thought about their diversity, how they thought about the programming that they launched to support um, black homeowners and Latinx homeowners. I mean, just really thoughtful stuff. So it's like, no one's coming from the belief that white folks can't be allies and champions for racial equity. But I do think that as philanthropy deals with its own stuff, it has to be in a position to call out when things are being done harmfully and not just result to the like, well, they're the only group that does this, so we'll just invest in them anyway and just kind of keep things moving. It's like, no, we, we actually have to be willing to disrupt the market and create new outcomes if we can't get there off of the existing groups that are there. And that's a tough place to be in. I, I, I have enough bruises to, to speak to that. But I think if we're gonna move past this espousing commitments in this space around equity and justice and move to actually operationalize it in meaningful ways, we're gonna get bumps, we're gonna get scars, we're not gonna do it perfectly, but we have to stay the course. That makes sense. I, I don't wanna be bruised too, too much more, but you and I are about to delve into to some work because you used the word harm probably five or six times in, your, in that sentence. And I wanna hold on, on that for a second because I wanna to turn to, to audience questions. Oh, and if you have a question, just, just Put your hand up, and then I'll repeat the question if you, if you have one. We, the, you, the foundation, um, has made the decision that, that philanthropy, that money should not be triaged into hate organizations. There's a threshold, um, Southern Poverty Law Center, that has tracked hate groups mm -hmm. around the country. So if a donor wants to give money through the foundation, that would eventually go to a, an organization that's on that list. You, the Seattle Foundation, has basically said, no, we're not, we're not gonna do that. You can take your money and go elsewhere. But that's a pretty low bar. You've risen the conversation, you and Ben Danielson and others, and said, hate groups are low bar. Let's not have philanthropy do harm. There's that, there's that language again. Let's not have donors um, allocate money, move money toward organizations that do harm. That's a tricky space to be in because I start thinking about or what organizations don't do harm. How do you make your way through a conversation about philanthropy not doing harm? Mm -hmm. How do you begin that conversation and who do you have that conversation with? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, you know this because you're in the midst of it <laughs> with me given your role, but it is, a, it is a tricky thing, but I feel like it's an important thing, right? It, this goes back to the, um, previous conversation around if we are really trying to move down this path in like an authentic way around equity and justice, that means there are things that we have to do. It also means there are things that we should not be doing, right? And, and, and this harm conversation is, I'd say fairly new kind of across, across philanthropy, right? When you look across the country and how folks are wrestling with this because the Southern Poverty Law Center, FBI screenings, like those provide legal standards to pull on, so it feels more cut and clear um, and legally you know, defendable in case something gets called into question. But harm is seen as more of kind of a gray area, right? And so what do you use to make those decisions? And in a lot of ways, I think it's gonna come down to 
um, values at the end of the day, right? And being willing to take and stand on a position even if folks disagree with it, right? And so the wonderful colleague at the foundation, Alice Ito, who's a long-term, uh, long-time community leader here in Seattle. She actually um, used to protest the foundation back in the day and then somehow they got her to um, be an ally and come into the fold. And she's my executive in residence for equity and inclusion. And I'm starting this process with her to really figure out, are there, are there frameworks or are there things that we can pull on that start to talk about um, harm and how philanthropy thinks about addressing harm that ultimately will lead us, if nothing else, to a set of questions that we have to ask ourselves when situations come up to know if we will allow funding to flow into that versus not, right? And they're really tough, complex, controversial issues to wrestle through around this, right? Things we see in the headlines all the time around, you know, defund the police. What does it mean to support community safety? What does that look like, right? Um, there were issues I saw in Cleveland around, um, you know, the building of new jails and how do we approach that and what's philanthropy's role in either pushing for certain things that really center um, justice in a real way or is that not the space to be in at all, right? And so tricky conversations, but I think we have to be willing to have those hard conversations. I think we have a while to go as Seattle Foundation to get into a clear sense of what that is, but my commitment is to us taking the journey to wrestle with that, right? Because as Alice has told me many a times, like there are things that have happened in this community around um, police brutality or other violent actions that, yeah, legally it might have passed muster, but like we know from a community standpoint, like none of that is good, right? It goes back to trauma and, and harm, right? And so how do we find ways to take further movement in this work, knowing it will be complicated, but important if we're trying to stand behind um, leaders, particularly leaders of color in this community that are fighting for justice, you know, racial, social, economic, and meaningful ways. If you have a question, please, please put your hand up. I'm curious how you think about your own philanthropy, your own engagement with organizations, and how does this, how does this come to a personal level for people? Because I'm thinking like, okay, how many questions do I ask of the people I give chance to? You mean my, like literally my own personal philanthropy? Okay, I was like, let me just make sure you mean what I thought you meant by that. Yeah, I mean, for me, in terms of my own um, personal philanthropy, I've taken a stance in the last several years to focus in on a few key areas, right? And so because of my background on the policy and political side, I have a deep interest in investing in work that supports um, candidates of color to run for office. And like, how to invest in um, organizations and collective PAC is one. I know the founders that created that are doing incredible work at the national level, but both are based in Cleveland, husband and wife uh, duo. Like I really spend a lot of time investing there to think about how do we support the pipeline. And then other things that I care about, again, are looking at what are the collective efforts that are coming together to support communities that are really pushing for social justice in a meaningful way. So one of the groups here that I adore and, and plan to support is the Black Future Co-op Fund. They have a relationship with Seattle Foundation, but as I've met the architects of that work and look at what they're aspiring to do across the state beyond my professional role, I'm like, this is work I need to be investing in personally. Again, Wanawari, I cannot wait to figure out the, who these folks are and how to meet with them. But like, when I think about the power of arts and culture around the things that we're talking about and how it shapes community, you know, that's a space where I like to ensure that I spend my time, but also think about where I make my own investments. So that drives me in terms of, um, what are the issues that speak deeply to me on the things that I care about and who are the, are the amazing leaders doing that work that I can just unleash dollars and go? You set the, your philanthropy table for us and I'm curious on a more personal side, who would you see around a dinner, your dinner table if you had the opportunity to invite four or five folks living or past oh my God. Um, for dinner? And maybe what would you, what would you serve? So, <laughs> so, so Amy Carter asks, um, setting the philanthropy table, who would Alicia invite to the table? Not necessarily a philanthropist. But just not, not the, yeah. And, and um, living or dead, and, um, and what would you serve? Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I, I know I won't cook because that just, that, that won't be good. Um, so it definitely will be catered. Um, and who would I invite? I mean, you know, it's an interesting mix of people that I think about. And so 
Um, if he were still living, someone I would love to invite would be Tupac Shakur, right? Um, just because of his broader persona around activism and just, you know, as complicated as his profile and how his life was as a human being, like he has left an undeniable mark on so many folks from my generation, even younger, older, right? And so to sit with him and see him as a human being and as a man, I would love that opportunity. Um, I'd put him at the same table with my mother because there is a lot that inspires me about her and the ways that she is uniquely different from the way that I am, even though people say at some point you do become <laughs> your parents, right? I still see a big difference. Um, but there is a way that she um, speaks life into people, particularly children and young people that is, is just like, I don't know how she does that, but she does it well. And I would love to see her in that kind of interaction with somebody like Tupac. Um, there is a wonderful um, mentor, and I consider him a friend, a gentleman named Dave Abbott, who actually is the former CEO of the George Gunn Foundation, who every and anything that I've learned about um, my career around policy and um, how to interact with government and how to think about philanthropy, he always told me that philanthropy is as hard as we make it, right? Because these are ultimately positions of privilege that we sit in. So we can just sit back and write the night's check to charity and call it a day, or we can lean in and do the hard stuff, right? And I implore you to do the hard stuff. And so I would love to see Dave at that table because I think he'd also get a kick out of uh, Tupac. He knows my mother already. Um, <laughs> And then lastly, I think someone that I have always admired, she's younger than me, but I've always admired is a woman named Leah Hutnall, who is in Cleveland. She is my example of what it means to speak truth to power. She has an incredible podcast that you should look up called Legacy Talks. It's her way of capturing the history of a particular black um, neighborhood in Cleveland through the story of her grandfather, because he has spent his entire life there. Um, moved from the South there and raised her family there. And she has gotten serious battle scars as a black woman in philanthropy that has tried to speak truth to power and has then been um, reprimanded by philanthropy for doing just that. But she's never not moved away from the work and really thinking about what does it mean to do this work in a way that connects deeply to breathing life into community in new ways. So I put them all at a table and then just sit back and watch it all, all play out. We should do dinner together because my mother, I would invite her, and she, <laughs> and she would invite the Temptations and Otis Redding oh, and James yeah, Brown, and we'd have a, but be, she would cook, be, right? Be, and then, and then, and then we'd have a little party, yeah, a little Tupac, yeah, be, with some generational nice. stuff That's going on right. too. So I love it. <laughs> other, other, other questions? So the Seattle Foundation um, has taken a shift um, a, a courageous, wonderful shift in terms of the leadership. Um, and I want to find out from you, do you see this as a shift that's going to move, or, or maybe through, for, you, for you and others, through the city as well? I mean, not as it just a, a DEI person that sits in the office, but okay. the head of the Seattle Foundation embodies DEI, yeah. is, you know. Um, how do we see the rest of the city taking shape now that you're here. Yeah. So yeah. The, the question is, is this shift that's happening, do you see this running through the city? Um, the purview of, of the Seattle Foundation is King County. Mm -hmm. How do you see this moving through you and being leadership that, that, that's embedded throughout the, throughout the county and, and to other organizations, right? And maybe get to that civic leadership part mm -hmm. of, of your portfolio, at least yeah. your beliefs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I came here at a really interesting time because I was a part of the latest wave of women of color that were being brought here to lead philanthropic institutions, right? And so I think of um, Tyra Mariani, who's working with the Schultz Family Foundation, who's been here about two years, um, Carmen Rojas, um, Latinx woman running the Marguerite Casey Foundation, who's been here for a couple years, and a number of others, and folks that have even moved um, into new roles of leadership around philanthropy at places like Gates. When I think about Angela Jones and others that are just coming on board, and so, you know, I haven't I haven't quite um, unlocked the full key to it. But I think to your question, I think there is a real opportunity and moment of time here of like how do we all collectively think about the way in which we come together, given that we are sitting in positions where to some degree or another, we either have leverage or control over or can influence significant resources. And then how do we, how do we use that collectively to dig into some of these conversations that are happening here on key issues, right? And so um, 
as I'm looking to 2023, these are some of the conversations I've been starting to have and really mapping out between, you know, the business sector and government leaders and other philanthropic leaders and organizations, like what's the almost like the coalition of the willing that I need to kind of build around myself? One, just to help me understand the landscape and move, but to your point, understand that what are the things that because it is us right now in these in this moment in time, what can we push and move on in ways? Because the players matter, right? The ability for big issues to move or not sometimes does come down to the people that are sitting at the top of different institutions or has control over certain systems. So if this is really the special moment that I think it is, I think it's a matter of how do we start to really uh, strategize with each other to think about the role we can play going forward. Frank Hodge, please. Frank Hodge, Dean of the Foster School of Business. Thank you for being here. I know you've done work in democracy building and democracy strengthening and just would like to hear your wisdom have you share some experiences about that work, and especially with today's younger generation, mm. as they look at today's uh, polarized political situation. So Frank is asking about democracy building, um, particularly among the, the next gener generation of people, Demo democracy building and democracy strengthening mm -hmm. as part of your work. Yeah, thank you. So there, there are a few layers um, that I'm just cognizant of in this space that I think um, kind of center left and left philanthropy, quite frankly, just has to get sharper at its strategies and how it thinks about engaging in this space. And so at the, I think at the local level, what typically is playing out, especially in this is era of social media where misinformation abounds, right? Like people are getting their, their news from sources that are, um, I think, arguably not, not the best sources, but it influences how they think about really important issues, right? And so, what I found in a lot of the work that I was doing in democracy building, but particularly looking locally, was folks just didn't have basic information or they didn't trust where the information was coming from. And, and that matters when you start to talk about um, when to vote, how to vote, who you're voting for, right? And feeling empowered enough to engage. And voter apathy is a term that has been out there, but we really got to the point where it's not about folks being apathetic. This really is a matter of trust, right? If folks feel like they never see their council people knocking on their doors and coming by and checking on issues, if they feel like when they're calling the city and can't get to the right person and nothing ever happens, it erodes trust in these very basic ways for residents. So what becomes the work to help people connect back to understand, yes, it's frustrating, but this local government system plays a major role in a lot of what happens in your neighborhood and your community. And you have power to impact this because you, you know, you're paying taxes, right? You're invested here, right? These people work for you. Like, let's remember the accountability system that works here, right? Because we've gotten away from it. So how do we support a lot of neighbor to neighbor actions and organizing and coalition building within neighborhoods themselves so people feel more accountable um, and feel more empowered to push? I mean, one of my best visuals for this is, I'm forgetting the exact neighborhood um, in Detroit, but it was a social service organization run by a number of older black women that like candidates did not make it to office if they didn't get the blessing from these folks in this community and they knew their power and they leaned into that deeply in terms of how they engaged at the local level. I think investing in ways that supports that again is so critical. I think at the broader system strategy level, I think we, again, center left, progressive left philanthropy is kind of missing the point here around, it is marrying the advocacy and education work with political strategy, right? Like right wing conservative philanthropy has been doing this for decades, phenomenally, right? From like uh, folks that they fund at higher education institutions on thought leadership and things they put into the world, think tanks, right? candidates that they support for office, there's been this long machine that has run around being very strategic around communications, thought leadership, and just kind of pushing core issues that is held. And um, it's not happened the same way on the other side. We kind of run at something for a couple years and then like attention span, we go off to another thing. And so what I have found in my work in investing in organizations and trying to work with other funders is that we have to be committed to the long game. We have to recognize how political strategy plays into this just as much as it's trying to find organizations to do basic education work. And we have to work with groups in a way that they see themselves as an aligned ecosystem and know how to play to their strengths. And that means getting out of the scarcity mindset of 
um, only funding groups to do a little bit or swooping in the states because they have a competitive race and then swooping out when it's over. What's the patient capital to do this over the long run? We've got about five more minutes in time for maybe one, maybe two more questions, please. So mm -hmm. what is your message as, as a leader to, to kids, to college kids, to young BIPOC leaders, black and indigenous people of color, to young leaders? Because you've got a number of them in the room here. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you the thing that I would have told 18, 19 year old me, right? Which is, um, it may feel scary, but don't lean into that fear. Um, you have every right to be in the room. You are equipped with everything that you need to step forward powerfully. Know your, know your allies, know your protection, know the folks that hold you down and lean into that. But like, don't, don't be fooled by the imposter syndrome. You truly have everything that you need. Is there a final question? Let me just say this much. Um, given what you've seen and heard of Alicia, who's seven months into Seattle. Um, I met her on a Zoom screen and, and interviewed her, and I saw this from a, from a Zoom. And when it came time to vote, I couldn't find that emoticon fast enough for the, for the hand to go, to go up and say, um, she's the kind of leader that we need in our, in our city and in our county right now. And do you, do you see that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing heads nod. Sally. I don't know if I was supposed to say this or, or if you were supposed to say this, Ed, but in full disclosure, Ed is on the board of the Seattle Foundation and has actually been leading the board of the Seattle Foundation for the past year, I think. And we probably should have done that at the start, sorry. Uh, but it means that you were well, uh, well grounded in what we were talking about. And Alicia, I couldn't be more grateful for the, for the time. Uh, uh, and you've been really great and very gracious in sharing uh, with us tonight. And um, I'm so excited to talk with you more about Cleveland politics and Seattle politics. <laughs> so one more round of applause for everybody. Thank you.